everyone. Welcome to the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. I'm Sydney Yeager, Public Programs Coordinator at the museum, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's inaugural New York Jewish Book Festival. This event is on writing the third generation of Holocaust survivors with Linda Kinsler, Menachem Kaiser, Helen Betia Rubinstein, and Ariel Angel. We hope you will explore the 32 events that are happening throughout the museum today, meet some of the 85 speakers, and get books signed at one of the 72 author signings in our main lobby and events hall on the second floor. While you are here, we also encourage you to take the time to visit our exhibitions, The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do, on the main level, and Survivors' Faces of Life After the Holocaust, photographs by Martin Schuller on the third floor. Andy Goldsworthy's Garden of Stones is also worth a visit, just outside of our wonderful Cafe Locks. Um, so the whole museum is open to you today. Um, you can also pick up holiday gifts and books at the Pickman Museum shop and visitor services on the main level. We are encouraging people to wear masks in the museum, and we hope you will share feedback with us in our post-festival survey, which will be in your inboxes tomorrow. This program is made possible in part by support from the Battery Park City Authority. Your donations also help us present these programs. This event is co-presented by Jewish Currents. And now I'm glad to introduce you to our speakers. Linda is the author of Come to This Court and Cry, How the Holocaust Ends. She is a contributing writer for Jewish Currents, and her award-winning journalism has also appeared in the New York Times Magazine, The Guardian, The Atlantic, The Economist, and more. She is completing a PhD in rhetoric at UC Berkeley. Menachem is the author of the memoir Plunder, a New York Times critic's best book of 2021, and the winner of the 2022 Sammy Rohr Prize for Jewish Literature. Helen's essays in fiction have appeared in Gulf Coast, The Kenyan Review, The Paris Review Daily, Literary Hub, and Jewish Currents, where she is a contributing writer. Her book, Feels Like Trouble, Transgressive Takes on Teaching, Writing, and Publishing, is forthcoming. She teaches at the New School and works one-on-one -on -one with other writers as a coach. Arielle is the editor-in-chief of Jewish Currents. She was a 2018 New Jewish Culture Fellow and a 2016 Fellow at Tent Creative Writing at the Yiddish Book Center in Amherst, Massachusetts. In addition to Jewish Currents, her work has appeared in The Guardian, Guernica, Off Assignment, and Protocols. Um, come to this court and cry how the Holocaust ends, plunder, and because sex is a story and sex is a song are available for purchase in our Pikmin Museum shop and lobby, and the authors will sign copies for a half hour after the event in the resource area in the events hall on the second floor. So please welcome Linda, Menachem, Helen, and Ariel. Uh, and I also just want to Thank you all for being here. I also just want to say Jewish Currents has a table in the main hall. Um, if you enjoy this conversation, you might enjoy Jewish Currents as all of these uh, brilliant authors are contributors. And actually, I could not be more thrilled to be moderating this event. Um, the topic of this uh, conversation, how we write about the Holocaust from the third generation is part of a conversation that I, I have been having with all three of these writers ongoing for the last couple of years and that they've been having with one another. So I'm really, really thrilled that we're all in the same place to have this conversation. Um, so I'll just jump right in. Um, so we, we know that uh, Holocaust literature is a genre in itself and that it has its own conventions. I think we're starting to become aware or to name the fact that third generation literature is, is itself a genre. Um, and I think all three of you deal with that in different ways. Um, I, I wonder if we could, I'm gonna start with you Menachem on this, but I wanna hear from all three of you. I wonder if we could um, kind of define that genre a little bit by way of talking about how we are either like embracing parts of it or, or pushing back on it. Um, if that makes sense. Uh, sure. I um, also just want to thank everyone. Uh, it was a really beautiful event. Thank you, Ariel, for moderating and Linda for inviting me. Um, is your mic on? I don't know. Oh, no, is it, it on? It no, it isn't on. Uh, you know, Ariel wrote, I th the first real, like review that I got for my book, I think was yours, when you wrote the Jewish Curtains newsletter and you wrote something, which, I, you know, it sort of took me by surprise, but I found it so gratifying when you wrote, this is the first book that is self-aware that it is this kind of book. And I was like, yes, what, that's what I was going for even if I didn't know it. 
And so, I, um, in a way, I'm like a, I'm an unusual candidate to have written a Holocaust book because it's something I never related to at all. Like I grew up, um, my grandparents were Holocaust survivors, and I had like no sense of sort of uh, bearing that responsibility. I wouldn't have used those words. Uh, Ariel was one of the first people I met on that artist retreat like 10 years ago. I was that there was like grandchildren of Holocaust survivors who were artists, and I was like, I don't belong here. This feels weird. It doesn't fit. Um, and they sort of pushed me to sort of recognize that maybe it does influence my character and my art. And I was, I'm still not entirely convinced. Um, but you know, for me, it was like I didn't relate to a lot of the books being written, and so like I. I don't feel that comfortable sort of passing judgment or even defining or even demarcating genres. But I was like, I don't relate to a lot of the books. I read them. And I was like, this person had clearly a profound experience and it's not speaking to me. And then I had my own experience and I was very reluctant to write a book about this. Very, very reluctant, even though I spent, by the time I sort of felt like I had no choice to write it, uh, I had spent about six years going to Eastern Europe pretty regularly and doing Holocaust related work and not seeing it sort of in conversation with my own experience or my own family's legacy for that matter. Um, and so I just had to write a book that I felt like I could relate to. And I think you I think you sort of put, you hit the nail on the head by saying there's, there's an awareness that there's a whole body of work that speaks to this experience and you cannot pretend like your book in any way or anything you're producing is sort of unique or sui generis. It's like it's speaking to everything else that's already existed. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, really quickly just to say that I think like we are maybe entering kind of a second wave of this kind of literature, um, even like a second wave of grandchildren literature. So I, I want to hear from the rest of you, but like that that self-awareness and the awareness of all the tropes that go into this kind of writing feels like you cannot write about it at this point without confronting the tropes themselves. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say reading your book, Menachem, like the final m chapter, you have this really stunning meditation where you write about what you thought this book would have been when you were originally thinking about it as a novel. And this kind of like ending scene of burning the house down, you know, and what that conflagration would have meant and how that would have concluded the book. This is the house that, um, that Menachem's grandparents owned before the war. Yeah, which, which becomes the subject of this legal suit and becomes this kind of er restitutive object, which I find totally mm -hmm. fascinating. But I do think that a strong commonality between all of our work, not only I are we all contending with law in various ways and these kinds of convoluted legal mechanisms that we've inherited by virtue of our own places as you know third generation, um, but also these inherited stories and tropes and forms. In my specific case, it was extremely literal in that uh, there was a novel written about my um, paternal grandfather who was a perpetrator. Um, and it took this genre of spy fiction and uh, I felt confronting that and discovering the legal case around it that I similarly had no choice but to engage, that it had the decision had already been made for me in advance. Um, and I think the narration of reluctance, you know, and I think, you know, both of you describe that in your books, this kind of awareness of ourselves as characters in a way, and this uncanniness of having to engage and not knowing quite how and needing to be self-aware of doing so. I guess I feel like really bluntly, um, like the genre is, and please disagree with me, I'm curious if you all agree, but um, like the genre was kind of defined by everything is illuminated. Yeah. Um, and to me that genre, which is not just a genre of fiction, but also a genre of experience is like what I have to contend with. Um, and I think, you know, I was thinking about both of your books this morning, we're all writing about grandfathers who we don't really know and are in some way like interested or not interested in reanimating. Um, and I don't know if you feel like the roots aspect applies as much to you, Linda, but there's something about like sort of stepping into this somewhat prescribed experience of a trip back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, maybe I'll, I'll actually 
skip, th that segues into one of the questions that I wanted to ask later, but I want to maybe bring it up. I mean, one of the things about everything is illuminated is the way in which um, an erased history becomes um, sort of repopulated with an imagined history. And there's a sense of like going back and being able to like reclaim the box that has all of the answers in it. And I think that something, uh, and that when I read that as myself, the grandchild of survivors, it really pissed me off, you know, because there's nobody waiting there with the box with all the answers in it. Um, th there's nothing left. And, and whatever you can get is just the, the smallest of, of um, fragments. And so I wanted to ask about knowability, um, particularly, and I think that that plays a role actually in all three of your work. Um, I mean, certainly, Linda, you're dealing with the law and, and the, the way that, that what we can't know is, is a very different question historically and legally. I think for you, Menachem, I think there's also a question about like, even like what we can know about a person's experience. Like if you walk the path that they walk, do you feel anything that they felt or can you actually know their experience? And I think for you, I mean, Helen, I feel like there's a whole other layer of like dealing with with Russian or like Soviet state archives and the kind of disappearing work, mm -hmm. um, the erasure of that work. So I wanted to, maybe we'll start actually with Helen on this question about um, knowability. Like about, I mean, it's not really a question, but like to, to speak a little bit to like how that shapes the work itself, like, like yeah. how the limits of knowability become a part of the story. Yeah, I mean, it's, to me, the question of knowability is only a question, um, like a very active question that I feel like I'm still actively contending with as I finish this unpublished manuscript that these three people have kindly looked at. Um, but I guess um, I just like to go back to everything is illuminated. I just the other day came across an interview with Foer where he said like on his real life trip to Ukraine, He's found nothing but nothing. That was the quote. Um, and I feel like each of us like has a sort of nothingness um, that we are contending with in these stories. Um, and I honestly feel really torn about whether to sort of succumb to the nothingness, write about the nothingness, bang it on the head, or more recently I'm more interested in finding ways to... Um, reanimate is not the word I want to use, but I'll just say reanimate the nothingness um, without sliding into fiction. So personally, I'm interested in ways that I can do that within nonfiction, as opposed to Foer's example, which is finding nothing but nothing, and then, boom, like populating it with all of these tropes. Sure. It, it, you know, I would sort of take it from the other side. And so not necessarily about knowability, but about really recognizing and admitting the unknowability, which maybe is the same thing. Yeah. And so, you know, for me, my, the central narrative of my book is reclaiming my grandfather's property. And so it's a very literal story of reclamation. And I felt from this moment that I was like, ugh, I'm gonna try and write a book about this, to writing the book proposal, to actually writing the book, I felt this a really strong sentimental gravity of like, okay, write it the way that sort of everyone says these stories, receives these stories. Like, I know my grandfather, I'm following in his footsteps, I'm reclaiming, there's like a catharsis here, there's redemption, and I, but like, I didn't actually believe that. But I felt a very strong pull that I was supposed to believe that. And this is the story that people were expecting to hear. And even, I, like, this is something I'm not supposed to admit, but like, to an extent, that's how I sold my book. I was sort of promised that. and kind of like semi-consciously. And so like, and, and that's what sort of the market wants. And uh, I was like, it's not honest. It's not honest, it's not honest. And like, the book I set out to write when, you know, uh, to pull the screen back a little bit, um, when I, my proposal went out to publishers and then uh, a few publishers were interested and they're like, every single meeting, they all ask the same question. They're like, how does the book end? And there was, I was like, I'm getting the building back. Of course I'm getting the building back. And I wasn't lying. I genuinely believe that was the case within a year, because that's what I was told. And then you know, I signed the book contract. And then you know, a year later, it was clear I was not getting the building back, at least in time for the book's release. 
And so I really did have to reimagine the stakes, but it did sort of open up. You're like, fine, be more honest about what the stakes are, because it's not actually about the building. And so for me, it was always fighting that sentimental gravity and sort of like being really honest with myself and hopefully with the readers about that this is like an unknowable story and an unknowable person whose legacy I'm sort of uh, inhabiting, like I'm sort of pushing for his legacy. And for me, it was really important to um, be honest that like I don't feel that sort of moral responsibility or sort of like the moral allowance doesn't pass down, at least automatically. Yeah, no, I think that's really interesting. And I do think, um, Menachem, one of the things that you describe is just the sheer exhaustion that comes along with inhabiting that kind of complicated posture. Um, I think in my case, you know, it was different uh, in that I had a similar experience selling my book where, you know, my paternal grandfather disappeared after um, serving first for the RIs commando, which was one of the most brutal killing commandos in the Baltic states, and then became a KGB agent and then disappeared. And someone said, are you going to find out what happened to him? And I said, I don't think so. And they said, don't tell the publishers. <laughs> um, and, you know, I felt I actually did feel a kind of moral imperative because I inherited on the one side this perpetrator story and on the other side this survivor story of the Riga Jewish community in which you know my mother grew up and in which I had heard stories from and in which I was primarily raised knowing about. Um, and so from the moment that I discovered this court case in which this man, Herbert Zuckers, who is the only Nazi whom Mossad is known to have assassinated, the court case was essentially reinvestigating him with the objective of finding out if he could be held responsible for the killing of Latvian Jews, despite the fact that he had been dead since 1965. And there was a moment when I was sitting in the prosecutor's office and they weren't sure in what capacity I was there as, as a kind of person with a familial connection to the case on both sides, um, or as a journalist or as a writer. It was like this very strange moment. But I think my role ended up being not about, you know, accepting unknowability, but rather pointing out that these things are knowable and so much is known. And it doesn't, you know, we have this imperative to say like, we want this forensic uh, ability to say, this is what happened, this is who pulled the trigger, this is the magic box that's gonna unlock all the clues to the past um, in this very neat way, and to actually use my role to suggest like, no, this is maybe enough already. Yeah, I mean, that uh, relates back to the question that I wanted to ask you in particular. I mean, um, I, I think all three of you think about representation. I mean, there's always the question of representation as it relates to um, the survivor generation or the events themselves. But I think something that you run up against, each of you in your own way, is representation of the, uh, the countries that outlasted and the people uh, that are there now, um, many of them themselves either the descendants of perpetrators or perpetrators themselves. Um, and I think that you each deal with that in very different ways. Um, you know, I mean, I'll start with you, Linda, because you're in your book, there is actually an active um, Latvian uh, revisionist uh, nationalist movement that plays very strongly into the story that you're researching. So like the Cougars, uh, is it? Sox. Suker, yeah. uh case. Uh, is has become this flashpoint in in like re um, yeah. re rehabilitating, rehabilitating sorry yeah. <laughs> <laughs> rehabilitating uh, you know Latvian history on some level and and um, uh, reclaiming you know a story that is a little bit nicer to to, to tell um, and I, and I think I, I think that operates actually quite different for both of you I mean Menachem like you are, I think, more on the line of like, we can't just paint all of these people with a broad brush, we can't, I mean, there's a, a very beautiful scene, I'll, I wanna like talk about each of your books and then let you speak about it, but there's a very beautiful scene in your book where you go into what you think is the house that your grandfather um, owned and meet the, these 
really wonderful. It's like it, it, this building used to be owned by like a theater company or like related to a theater company, and there's this extremely beautiful um, uh, like community around this building. Like, what would it be to then take the building back from them? You know, like what would that actually look like? And I think Helen, with you especially, uh, you have a wonderful, beautiful excerpted piece in Jewish Currents that you should definitely read called Travesty Show, um, looking at kind of buried, um, both Jewish, buried Jewishness and queerness in, in Ukraine. And I feel like also there's this wanting to be close to people and also recognizing the distance. So I just wanted to ask each of you and start with you, Linda, about what it means to represent these societies in the present and, and if you feel a sense of, or of responsibility in doing that kind of work in this moment. Yeah, I mean, I feel, yeah, like an immense responsibility because I really didn't want it to be a book about Latvia in my case. I was compelled to write it because I thought the case that I was looking at in my mind was a kind of direct successor to the Eichmann trial in that you know, some of the same agents were involved, some of the same testimonies were involved, and yet it was this kind of direct inversion of that process in which there was this world historical trial that was televised the world over and everyone knew about it, and here we are, you know, however many decades later, no one knows about this process, um, and yet, and all the same logics are being kind of twisted and undermined. But at the same time, obviously, I couldn't escape this on the one hand, like it was a requirement that I document these revisionist efforts because, of course, they had already wound their way into the court case themselves and the kind of culture that allowed for these legal decisions to occur. Um, and so, honestly, the parts about the revisionist efforts and the kind of outright denialism were the hardest to write because I'm always aware of the fact that no matter what you write about them, you are in some way amplifying them and kind of spreading them around. Um, even if you are doing so for the purpose of justice, ultimately, I would like to think. Um, but, you know, I think one way that I tried to get around that was by writing about the idea of nationalism, which did emerge in Latvia, um, among other places, you know, uh, when Herder was kind of roaming around the Latvian countryside collecting these folk tales and c came up with the idea of the kind of romantic nation. And I tried to use that as a frame for thinking about it because it's all about inherited stories. And um, I found these, uh, that the Jewish community at some point had translated um, Latvian Dane as the poems into Yiddish uh, and vice versa. And so there had been this kind of exchange of ideas and stories. And so that was the kind of idea that I was playing with. And I tried to foreground that and to suggest that this case was very small, very important, and more reflective of a historical moment than a precise, you know, particular nation, I guess. Maybe that's dodging the question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm coming from kind of a different place than Linda. Linda, if I may, is in addition to being a wonderful writer, is, is a scholar. Like, you know, she, her language, like I don't have the languages, I didn't have access to a lot of things. And for me, it was very important going in to again, recognize my limitations. And so I actually kind of ignored as much as I could because I didn't actually feel like I have the authority. Now that didn't work up until a point because I was pursuing a court case. And in 2015, there was sort of a new government came into power and did sort of at the very least potentially influence um, my own case because there was a like a full on assault on the judicial system. And so I had to sort of at least uh, wonder, if not doubt, uh, about my judges. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I can't ignore that process. Mm -hmm. uh, but I definitely keep it very to my own perspective. Like I, that I, you know, there was a big section about like the what was going on, and I, that was probably one of the most research intensive sections, and most of it got cut, mm -hmm. actually. And like, thank God, mm -hmm. uh, you know, thank because I was like, I'm, I'm stepping way out mm -hmm. of my circle here. I will say the issue of representation has come up a lot more since the book came out, mm -hmm. um, and from the other side. And so the, the question at every single book event, I would say the question I've gotten, maybe a, approaching 100% of the book events, mm -hmm. as in something like, w what do you think about the 
Polish anti-Semites. What do you think about anti-Semitism in Poland? Something along those lines. And you know, my answer at this point has become rote, but it's true. As in, like personally, I experienced none, nothing. As in, like I've been going to Poland for ten years, and from a personal experience, my experience has been wonderful. Like through individual polls. Now, I think there was some really complicated uh, systemic uh, stuff, like especially within the court system, that is tough. It's nuanced. It's hard to identify. And I'm I'm very critical of the current government. But like again, personally. Um, hard to pass judgment, and I like I want yeah you're right I don't want to paint with a broad brush, um, and then once in a while I'll get something from the Polish side, and they tend to be kind of like the fate my favorite review of the book um, that I got was from a Polish nationalist scholar uh, who accused me and this kind of just like really was wild he accused me of the phrasing is important selective Judeocentric morality. Which is amazing. I was like, of course. <laughs> but uh, and so you just you Wait, can't. Wait, how do you understand that? What is that? Term? Yeah, how do you how do you understand that? He term? was like, you're focusing on Jewish stories. I was like, of course, yeah. I, but I was like, it's not like I filled the quota for the year of like uh, World War Two books. Uh -huh. I was like, knock yourself out. Uh, but I was also it was very funny. Uh, but it was also it was like another lesson. You just can't escape it. And so the book is coming out in Poland. Um, mm. in, a f in a few oh, months. Oh, we actually talked about whether that was going to yeah, happen. Yeah, it's coming out in Poland in a few months, and um, you know maybe it will sort of be a blip on the radar. But I'm, f I'm sort of the publishers are expecting a backlash, mm -hmm. um, and they're they they said they're excited for it. I think I believe them, <laughs> um, but I'm I'm super interested in it. Wait, I w I just want to quickly go back to Linda because I know that you I mean you just mentioned before this event that there's been some pushback also in your case. I mean, I try to not engage with it, but um, yeah, I mean, I have been accused, of course, of defaming the Latvian nation, which was one of the comments that was relayed to me via email. But I think like that is what was always going to happen and that was what I was prepared for going into it. Um, and that is, of course, not what I intend to do, nor what I think the book does. I think there's a... Um, one of the things that someone told me uh, in the Jewish community in Riga as I was reporting was, you know, the reason that they weren't making a bigger stink about this was because it was a question of patriotism, because they were Latvian patriots and because the... the yeah, because the, they are part of the modern nation and to fight this fight is to be a good citizen in a way. And so to read that as pushing against the nation is a, you know, it's a very revealing sentiment. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I have been kind of just letting that go to the side, and for me, it's a kind of deliberate effort to have a history, have a narrative. You know, there was a high school teacher in Latvia who said, you know, we don't have stories to tell about the Holocaust. We don't have, you know, they hadn't yet been translated into Latvian. Um, the few ones that they did have were all in Russian language, so some of the younger children couldn't read them yet. Um, and I thought, okay, well, I can con contribute one story, uh, even if it's a very convoluted one. I, uh, just one quick addendum. It's just like the thing that I actually glossed over the most were not the politics of the Polish government, but they were the politics of the Jewish community in Poland, mm. which were com beyond. It's a shit storm like you can't imagine, and like that's a thing that people are sort of not ready. They're sort of shocked because that shakes like their sort of conception of like a Disneyland where everyone's getting along and doing sort of Holocaust tourism and like the politics and the corruption are, are rampant. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, that, though, that also got smoothed over quite a bit. Yeah, um, so my book is a case against me for the crime of telling a story about a case against my grandfather. Um, and part of what makes story a crime in the context of my manuscript are these failures of representation. Um, and I feel like in terms of representing present day populations, like I really don't try because it seems so impossible, but I attend to the impossibility of it. Um, and also to kind of disrupting the monolithic narratives that I come into contact with. Um, so there are some a lot of my book is about like interview and interrogation, um, and there are scenes of interviews where, for instance, my grandfather on my mother's side, who survived the war in Poland and lived in the U.S. starting in the 50s, 
um, the person who interviewed him for his Shoah Foundation testimony like has a lot of assumptions about Polish and German people that he wanted to disrupt and that I feel sort of devoted to disrupting on the page as well. Um, but I don't feel like I make a great effort to engage with contemporary communities beyond that. Um, I th 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 This question that I'm about to ask actually is really close to, m to my heart in terms of like the thing that has made this almost like too much for me to write about personally. Um, which is a which is a question about ownership and and exploitation, um, and I feel like I mean, Menachem, you have a line in your book that I feel like is really extremely important for all of us to remember, which is that we are not the sequels to our. This isn't like our stories are not like our grandparents' sequels, right? Um, and we can't really like pick up. Where, where they left off. We're not, we can't make ourselves the protagonists of their story, right? Um, and at the same time, like, and, and at the same time, we're also in an environment where there's incredible um, weaponization of anti-Semitism, uh, even as anti-Semitism is rising, there's also its weaponization uh, in, in a number of different contexts. And there's a question about how are these narratives used? Why do people want them? And also, like, are they ours? Are they ours to tell? Are we? I mean, there are th two different questions here, here, but I think they're related. Are they? Are these stories ours to tell? On the one hand, and on the other hand, in telling them, are we automatically um, kind of participating in a kind of exploitation of those stories? So I'm not. I mean, I want to hear from all three of you on this. Um, I don't have. I don't know who who wants to go. I have a thought. I was because I was thinking about it earlier, Menachem, when you were talking about the sentimental pull, um, and I don't know to what degree or like I don't know what connotation you mean for sentimental when you were thinking about that. Um, but I was just thinking about how that word, you know, which is about sentiment, but also about sentimentality and sort of overplaying emotion. Um, relates to also marketability with which both you and Linda were talking about the literal sale of your book in relation to these questions. Um, and I think for me, and maybe this is what you were articulating too, Ariel, like though the fact of sentimentality and the marketability of this kind of story, the fact that it's generated income for Hollywood, for instance, um, to me stains the whole genre and the whole enterprise. Like even if you have, even if you really just want to do something like a roots trip, it's like stained by its, in my view, it's sort of stained by its association um, with exploitative storytelling. Well, so well, just to like not let you off the hook, like how do you navigate that in your own work? I mean, I'll just say uh, Helen has a really wonderful essay also on Jewish Currents that you should read called This Is Not a Yom HaShoah Instagram Post, which is kind of dealing with, it's very good. It's really, it's, it's a barn burner. Um, but it's really about kind of like every year, you know, Yom HaShoah comes around and there's this kind of, um, you know, I mean, like, let me just name some of the things you name in the piece. like. Stand With Us, which is an Israel advocacy organization with uh, a, um, a graphic of Holocaust uh, survivors in the camps kind of fading into Israeli army uh, soldiers, which like regardless of what you think about that, like is that what they died for? Is that, you know, like we, we don't really know. I mean, like there was a lot of political opinions all the people that were, were there. It's sort of, um, it's kind of interesting to think about these images as being used for something. And, and also in like political, I mean in the economy of social media, like pictures of our grandparents being used on some level for just self gratification on some level. Like this is attention that's being drawn to us as the carriers, as the keepers of that story. So, um, I mean, I just want to hear from you how you deal with that and continue to write about the Holocaust in, in that environment, basically. Yeah, I mean, I think I have two answers to that question. One is simply, like, I think I just have to explicitly 
attend to the exploitation of the narrative. Um, and in my fantasy, you know, if my book sells, I have this private vow that I, I'll make a little bit more public now where I, I feel like I would love to be able to reject any or to redistribute any US income from the sale um, and to only take European income. Somehow to me that feels like that would be the just way of dealing with this. And the reason is because I feel like these stories have become a kind of US propaganda um, where they, it's, it's been used to um, support so many kinds of American mythologies in ways that make me really uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, I think I would approach this question from a very different angle in that I was responding to kind of blatant uh, instrumentalization of these stories for revisionist and denialist ends. Um, and so I felt that, okay, since we're already so far down this road, um, I felt less that I was taking possession of them, even though of course I was by trying to put them together in a book, but rather I was just, you know, putting all of these pieces out and connecting them and showing how they are all related. And most importantly, by showing how this you know, knowability gap, um, or whatever you want to call it, that we have inherited in the form of testimonies, how it's almost this like epistemological problem that we um, have these legal documents, we have these videos, um, and when we were at this moment, which we've been anticipating for a very long time, of, okay, what status do we give these documents? What status do they have legally, morally, historically? It's something that has been a really big issue in Polish courts. Um, and I basically saw how these documents, because of their origin or because of they had been because of the way they had been collected, uh, were being kind of thrown out. Um, and that was a really interesting question for me in terms of what do we use these for and what do we want them to do? Or do you, when you just kind of, we put so much work into collecting these stories and then only to shelve them away and to kind of not know how to combat the very obvious um, kind of, uh, I don't know, defense attorney line where you say, uh, this person is no longer with us, so they cannot be, you know, cross-examined. So this no longer counts, you know. And so that was what I was coming out from. Is like, okay, how do we even reclaim these things as operative in a in the way that they were intended to be when collected? Uh, yeah, you know, again, I didn't grow up with Holocaust stories. I grew up with sort of like a general Holocaust education. I went to Orthodox schools my whole life. I did not grow up with my grandparents' stories, and so I didn't feel sort of on either side. I didn't feel a sense of ownership, and I certainly feel feels like there was nothing to exploit. Mm -hmm. And so um, I never had any misgivings mm -hmm. about it. For me, it was um, much more of a personal artistic question. I was like, can you write, not even, you know, that sounds too highfalutin. Like, can it be interesting and meaningful on its own, mm -hmm. really? And I was like, I, the argument that these things are important, I'm, I get, I understand that argument. I don't feel it in my bone. Like, to be really honest, it's hard. Like, because I read a lot of these books and they don't move me. And so I'm like, I'm like, I, I, I understand these are important books as a genre, as individual books, I'm like, great. I'm, like, I'm happy it exists, but like, so, but so I'm not setting out to write a book that's sort of quote unquote important, that's sort of contributing to the literature. I was just like, write a book that's sort of good and interesting and honest. And I'll say again, to again, show you how the sausage was made in my case, um, when I began the reclamation process in 2015, I was I promised that I wouldn't write about it. Uh, not because I had any misgivings, because I was like, I have nothing to write. I was like, this is sort of interesting to me because it's allowing me to access questions and issues that I find interesting in a broader sense. But I was like, this story's been told a million times. And it wasn't until a year later when I, the, uh, the other part of my book has to do with treasure hunters. And so like I fell in with like Nazi yeah, treasure you hunters. Say a little bit about that. Right. It's it's sort of a long story, but I, I became a minor celebrity among a subculture of Nazi treasure hunters, right? <laughs> and so that happened and I was like I, I was like, God damn. I was like, now I have no choice but to at least try and sell this book. And so to an extent I was like, you know, I was in grad school, I wanted an agent, I wanted a book deal. I was like, 
here's here's my shot. I was like, I could probably sell my book about Nazi gold quicker than I could sell my weird novel about Yiddish poets. And I was I was right. <laughs> So uh, yeah, I, all these, but I didn't have any misgivings about exploitation, which doesn't doesn't mean I shouldn't. Well, I and thought. you, well, but you also told me that I mean, I'll just share with the the audience here that you also wrote some of this more self conscious stuff about selling what it means to sell this story, and like what it means to, to for it to be a careerist kind of like what it means to make make hay from all of this basically. And that was in the book, and the agent was sort of like, "Well, if you put this in the book, you're you're telling your audience that what they think is important about this is not really, Im or you're cheapening that, you know." And I don't think, by the way, like the book is, it's a really all of these writers are incredible, and all of these books are amazing. Uh, your book doesn't come off as anything less than completely honest, and and it's like very clear that this is a real unmediated kind of uncynical experience, even even in the moments where the cynicism is kind of the point. So, but I just wanted to, to raise that, that like that was actually more a part of the book initially. For sure, the, you know, um, I had a sort of particular issue to my thing is that I had very specific stakes to my book, which was w will I get this building back or not? And then all of a sudden I did, those stakes sort of were pulled out from under me. And then I, was, I had to sort of confront way after I had sold the book, way after I committed to writing it, then what were the stakes of the book? And on some level, when I was being really honest with myself, the stakes of the book might have been the book itself. Mm -hmm. But that's not a, a message <laughs> that you sort of could sell widely. And so I, that had part had to be extracted. That was the chapter that all my writer friends loved and everyone else was like, this is get out of your own tuchas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think what you are describing is also uh, to the kind of subject of this panel, you know, this kind of thing that I would say uh, describes at least these third generation efforts. And, you know, I don't think it's a total accident that all of our books to some extent have formal similarities and that we're all in the position of like, you know, having legal documents to navigate. That's, I wanted to actually <laughs> ask about the, well, go ahead. Or, no. Just one thing though, but I don't think this is special to like our genre. I, I don't believe any nonfiction book writer at w some level the ambitions for writing a book are careerist. True. Like every True. single person <laughs> who ever wrote a book, part of the reason they're writing a book is in order to write a book. True. And then you don't see that mentioned. <laughs> and so it just happens to be we're writing within the subject, but I think it applies True, very widely. True, but in terms of the way that, that the Holocaust is sacred, right? A and, and for us, I think that's a really different thing because we're talking about something that is sacred, but it's actually just our lived experiences. It also means like our parents and like all the different ways that they're messed up and all the different ways that like we have to you know, n that we're navigating this, um, you know, what is basically just our lives, which are, which, you know, our lives, everybody's life is holy, but our lives are also just our lives, you know. Um, so I think that there is a difference. And also the, the, w the interest level is a lot different in the Holocaust. And, and because those narratives are so, are, are being utilized in so many different ways that people are taking something from that. I mean, I would, I would just ask the audience right now, like, what is your investment in Holocaust narrative, you know? And think about sort of like what it means to want that, to want to engage in that. Um, so, you know, I mean, it is different. I mean, also these stories are, are bigger than, you know, larger than life. Like, the, this, is the, this is the stuff of drama. It's life or death stakes, and it happened to people in our family, you know? So I think it, I, I agree with you that in all, in th but there is something different. There's something, like, categorically different, I think. And I mean, obviously, I'm sure there's similar you know, analogs, but but I just want to ask, because I feel like we're getting to the point where I'm going to have to take audience questions, but I do want to talk about the law as quickly as possible, because it is, I, I feel like I've shunted it to the end of this discussion, but it's such a big role in all three of your projects, um, which, like, now I'm sort of, like, wondering why that is, like, it, does it have to be, like, you know, I mean, I think there are, there are court cases in all three, um, Linda, yours is the Sukers court case, the, the like question of whether he pulled the trigger, whether right. he was involved mm -hmm. in, in the mass um, executions. And for you, it's um, Menachem, the restitution of the building, but also the very Kafka-esque trying to prove that your relatives are dead, even though they could not by any measure be alive at this point. 
Um, and in yours also, you're, you're also in a rehabilitative project before your grandfather. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I would, I would love to, to hear more about it, but I think in, in all cases you're dealing with sort of like this gap right between like what the law is set up to do in some cases and in some cases what it's set up to do in an explicitly political sense having to do with kind of a national um, moment or narrative and like you know the the truth as you know it or or like kind of some murky idea of what justice is so I thought maybe you could each talk quickly about that before we take uh, a few audience questions. I mean, I think it's not a mystery. I don't think there's any question in my mind why we all gravitated to these, um, you know, formal ways of handling these stories. Like, A, because they were presented to us, right? It's inescapable. Mm -hmm. Or we sought them out, you know. But also because, uh, you know, and you could talk about the genre of the procedural and how that makes you think about character and even how a legal case is itself a form of literature and how it kind of I incorporates the public just by existing. Uh, but I also think we're at this moment when law is the place where these questions of knowability and ownership um, and inheritance and restitution are being played out at this particular moment because those categories and even what those things mean is so unstable and unknown, even by the people who are entrusted with making those decisions, you know, on all sides, be like the lawyers, the judges, the commentators, whatever. I was really struck by this kind of sense of bewilderment, my own bewilderment, but also that of everyone who knew about this case, that it was happening at all, you know? And um, sometimes I would talk to people and they would be like, what, like how could that be real? How could this be playing out in real time? And I think like there's this kind of wonderment and horror that comes along with that. Yeah, I don't know that I have anything to add for, to that. I feel like your book deals with these questions of like legal history, law, and storytelling so amazingly. Um, so I defer to you. Um, yeah, in, but I'll say the law was not always a part of my book project. Um, it was something that came up later when um, I went seeking the file of my dad's father who had been a ghetto leader in Transnistria on the border of Romania and Ukraine during the war and had been sent to Siberia after the war, um, which was a really common outcome for people in those positions. Um, and I only realized kind of deep into this process how central a mystery and a tragedy it was for my father's family. Um, and so my book deals with those documents directly and with that story directly, which is part of a larger story about Jewish ghetto leaders and what their role was um, and how they're portrayed um, in, by history, which maybe has a similar authority to the law and in memory. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we will take a few questions. Do you want to? <coughs> my name is, <coughs> excuse me, my name is George Schwab. I am reading your book, Brown. I have several questions, but I also want to mention that I was born in Libau in Liapaya. I went through the war in Libau, in the Libau ghetto, Kaiserwald, Riga, before going to Stutthof, and I came here as a child. Mm -hmm. <coughs> in a sense, I'm a child survivor. So. It's very familiar to me what you've been discussing brilliantly, so brilliantly. I compliment you. The question I have is, when you speak of your grandfather, Boris, and I'm in the middle of the chapter, have you th thought about it psychologically? Was he a self-hating Jew? Was he... Uh, uh, did he have an animus toward fellow Jews? He wasn't Jewish. I just want to, before you go a little bit further, right? He yeah, wasn't yeah, He yeah. wasn't Jewish. He was not Jewish. So my mother's family were um, Soviet Jews, Austrian Jews. Oh, he was Latvian. Yes, ah, yes. He had no Jewish blood. So no, no. no. Um, yeah, and so obviously I have thought about it immensely from... 
I guess I should say my family has thought about it immensely about um, who was this person, uh, what motivated him to join the commando. Um, and, you know, Rudita Vixne, who's one of the kind of prime scholars of this, she has this amazing compendium of reasons of why all the men joined the RS commando, um, if it was their hatred of the Soviets or if it, um, their hatred of the Jews or a conflation of both or a simple desire to have guns and bread. Um, I try not to, like, because I was so allergic to trying to be close to this person who was my grandfather and, you know, functionally estranged, you know, my father never met him. I didn't grow up with my father. I grew up only in this kind of Jewish community. And it was the strange circumstance that brought me to this story. I really tried not to think about him too much other than as this character that I needed to f deal with in some way. Um, yeah, and I think that it's this reluctance of wanting to kind of come too close to the story. Um, and how I dealt with it was kind of writing about this case, you know, writing about how other people had understood him rather than how I understand it. I've read of the genre by Anderson, The Loft, Curses, Three Men from Poland, and your book, Stain, Big Heaven, were both fabulous. I particularly loved the, uh, the payoff at the end. You know, one, at the beginning of the book, that you actually decided to do this. No spoilers. <laughs> and then the, the payoff at the end is fabulous. So, um, you know, the middle is what it is. You've already described what you eventually did. say about my parents. You know, I don't know what to say about them. I knew them my whole life. But and and now my children and, and you know your your grandchildren, you are grandchildren to these people. You know, I don't I don't know what more to say about them. And uh, I can't. But I can say that reading memoirs, like I I won't read any of these Ellen memoirs. I don't I mean, that stuff is is done and gone. But it's the memoirs of people who are still searching for Any other? I think we have a few more minutes if anyone else has a question. Yeah? Hi. Hi. My question is to show all the other authors. Uh, some of the human stories you've been sharing, how come it's not uh, influencing legal policy like people might hope in the countries that the stories are situated in? Like, it seems like there's a lot of pushback. Well, I mean, I guess I'll answer that just quickly. Um, the case I write about remains under investigation uh, oh. officially, you know, it's uh, kind of was closed and then reopened and has been the subject of debate and it's just kind of hovering there in abeyance, which is also this kind of strange Kafkaesque situation. Um, so I don't know. Well, I, I'm just a little schnook, like no, no one cares. <laughs> but but can you but Menachem, can you actually yeah. say something about like where the Polish courts are with cases of restitution? Like I'm sure you have something sure. like in terms yeah. of your own experience about like where where the country is at around that. In in a way, my like we, the the term the easy term to use is restitution. My case is not technically restitution because it's not being taken back from another family. So my my case in particular is actually a much more straightforward inheritance claim. Turns out it's not that straightforward, but there's no. There is no mechanism in Poland to take back property. If it was nationalized or somehow someone else got on the deed, by and large, it's almost impossible to, to, to undo. There's a very complicated politics, specifically in Warsaw, where the most valuable real estate is, and the rest of the country, it's just like municipality to municipality is going to be um, just sort of wild variants. Um, there is a lot of activism that goes on uh, with sort of like organizations like the WJRO that operate at the diplomatic level individual cases very, very rarely are sort of like big enough, important enough, 
you know, um, if anything, I, you know, my case, if it gets any recognition, it might very ironically undermine my own claim because mm -hmm. I committed perjury. And so if my case, if my book gets any recognition in Poland, it would be very clear that I committed perjury, which would be honestly the most hysterical conclusion yeah. <laughs> to, 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 to this, if the book that I wrote about reclaiming property actually undoes my reclamation. That would be, honestly, be it's a beautiful, it's, the, it's a beautiful ending. Or uh -huh. it, I get indicted and we're, yeah. it's, the story's finished. If I can also add, I mean, I do think one of the stunning things and like another layer of the story that you tell is that the word reparation, the definition of reparation that we use today in international law comes from this case, the Chorzo factory case, which was about a, a nitrogen factory started by a famous Jewish family uh, after World War I that was then you know, dispossessed, Aryanized, and they fought to get it for a very long time. And so it, there's this kind of other layer to the very origins of what you are looking at. <laughs> I think that is it. Um, thank you guys so much. I hope that you will join these authors that they're signing. And I also hope that you will subscribe to Jewish Currents because uh, we are really committed to this conversation about Holocaust memory in the third generation and, and beyond. Um, and you can definitely read all of these three authors and their work on our site. And we have a booth upstairs. And that's what you guys will be signing upstairs. I'll yeah. say quickly, my weird chat book that I brought along to sell did not arrive. But I have one copy for a lucky winner if you want to <laughs> buy it from me. But I won't be signing anything upstairs. <laughs> OK, great. Thank you, everyone. Okay.